because there are always things I like to do there better than I like to do philosophy. No mistake about it, I find doing philosophy extremely hard. Right? Except on the very, very few moments when one's had a very good fall and one's like riding a surfboard into the coast. My book is called Aspiration, The Agency of Becoming, and um, it's about trying to become a better person than the person that you are, um, but not in that unrestricted way that I just described it, trying to become a better person in some specific respect. So like a better tennis player or a better listener to classical music or a better mother. Um, and my view is that a big part of improving when the improvement is really kind of a substantial one and kind of changes who we are, is a matter of coming to grasp a new set of values. All right, so an example that I keep coming back to in the book is a case where you want to come to appreciate classical music, right? And maybe you do appreciate it a tiny bit, right? So maybe there are like a few pieces that can entertain you for a short time or something, but you feel like you're missing something. Like there's a lot more there to be appreciated than what you're currently responding to. And so say you take a music appreciation class, um, then um, it looks like there's a kind of paradox about your motivation, right? Because your reason for taking the class is like the intrinsic value of music. That's what you want to appreciate, right? But it's not the intrinsic value insofar as you already do appreciate it. Because I mean, that you've already got and that's not what you're trying to get, right? What you're trying to get is the bit you don't have, right? So it's sort of the value insofar as you can't yet grasp it. But insofar as you can't yet grasp it, you can't yet grasp it and it can't motivate you, right? And so it looks like, um, you know, the thing that should motivate you in taking the class, right, is the thing you're gonna get out of it, but that's not a thing you yet have or have access to. Of course, there's another op there are other options for why someone might take a classical music class, like they might do it to impress their friends, right? Um, or to appear to, become, to, to appear to be a lover of classical music because there are some social rewards uh, for doing that. Um, but those, you know, we, we wouldn't want to think that those were the only cases, right? We'd want to think that it was possible to take a classical music appreciation class because you actually wanted to come to appreciate classical music, right? And in that sort of a case, it looks like your motivation has to be the intrinsic value of classical music, but it can't be, the reason I just gave. So my book is about that paradox. It's about how is it possible to try to come to appreciate something, given that your only reason for doing it has to be the value that you can't yet appreciate. And what I argue is that the reason this looks impossible to us is that there are a bunch of assumptions that we're making in a couple different areas of philosophy, um, which if those assumptions were true, it wouldn't be possible to aspire, as I'm understanding it. Um, so they must be false because I think it is possible, right? And so I try to identify those assumptions. So first part of the book is about um, decision theory, the theory of rationality. And what I argue there is that um, there are um, really, I guess, two, let's say, um, um, impediments to the theory of aspiration um, within um, that part of philosophy. One of them is the idea that all um, agency is a matter of decision. So um, in, uh, if we're thinking about somebody becoming an appreciator of classical music or becoming a mother, right? That we should structure that in terms of a single point, a single moment of decision where, so to speak, before that moment, right? they had no access to the value. And after the moment, they um, have full access to the value, right? So it's like you flip a switch or something and then you become the thing you want to be. Now, that's actually a pretty hard way to um, model becoming a lover of classical music, right? And that already illustrates the problem. But so, so that's actually not the example that people have focused on in the literature when they've talked, when they've used the decision model, they focus on um, so one example people like to talk about is pregnancy, like having a child, right? And so the idea is like, um, you know, the minute you, and then actually which moment we should, we should pick out to me is not clear. Let's say you feel the baby kick or something or you see the positive pregnancy test. Now you've transformed into a mother, right? And you have these different 
desires and um, uh, kind of phenomenal experiences. And there's a different way of being for you, right? That, that wasn't there before. And you decided, in this, in this example, you decided to have that happen to you, right? By throwing away the birth control pills or whatever. That was the decision. And so then the question that philosophers want to ask is like, what would it be for that decision to be rational, right? Um, and one philosopher, Lori Paul, has, she's even given us a, a way of modeling that real life example in terms of a fictional example that's even more decision-y, right? So, so we had the classical music example, which I say, it's not naturally really very decision-y. And then we have the having a child example, which is still, it's still not clear that like you do something and then the result is that you're transformed. But so the example she uses is becoming a vampire. So the idea is, suppose that it were um, uh, made available to you to become a vampire, right? And if you become a vampire, you um, will have radically different preferences and experiences from the ones you have now. So you will lose interest in emotional connections to all the people around you. You'll be immortal. You'll have great fashion sense. Um, you won't like daylight, right? Um, you will want to drink blood. Um, so like you, none of those things describe you now, right? And so um, you, um, so now you have to ask yourself like, sh should I do it? Should I become a vampire? It doesn't look that attractive, right? Because it doesn't satisfy any of your current preferences. But I mean, if you decide to become a vampire, those will be your preferences. And then you'll, you'll, you'll say, oh, I love this. I love being a vampire. You know that because all your friends have decided to become vampires and they love it. And they say, do it. It's great, right? And then the question is, what would it take, right? What would it take for the decision to become a vampire to be rational? And it looks like there's a fundamental problem here. Um, at least if you model this as a decision and then you approach it as a decision theorist, right? Because the decision theorist is telling you, well, the rational decision is the one that ma maximizes the expected satisfaction of your preferences, right? The problem here is that there are two sets of preferences. The preferences you have now, pre-vampire time, and the preferences you will have if you decide to become a vampire, right? It's sort of like the pregnancy case, right? Suppose now you have all these preferences like liking to have lots of free time and... Um, you know, sleeping through the night, right? And, you know, if you have a child, you'll just like, won't be able to satisfy those, right? You'll have new ones that you can satisfy, like looking at your cute child or something. But the question is, you know, um, what should you do when you have these two um, radically different preference bases from which you might make the decision? And um, at least some people have thought um, there's no answer to that question within decision theory. Other people, Paul is among them, Paul thinks, None of the conventional answers work, but maybe you could model it. You, you, could, you could decide to make the choice rationally if you decided it solely on the basis of whether or not you wanted to have new preferences. I won't go into that details of that. I don't think that works. Um, so effectively, I don't think anyone really has shown us how the decision theorists can make sense of these sorts of choices. But I think the problem was seeing it as a decision to start out with. So I don't actually think there's a problem with decision theory. That is, it's usually posed as a problem with decision theory. It's like, here's a decision they can't make sense of, right? But if you shouldn't have thought about it as a decision in the first place, then there's no problem with decision theory. There's just a problem with how we've modeled these, this form of agency. So as I understand it, this form of agency is essentially extended over time. So it can't be understood as a um, uh, something like where there's... Um, you know, a period of ignorance of the new value and then something that you do and then knowledge, right? It has to be understood in terms of a learning process where over time you're coming to know the value of say being a parent or um, classical music. I don't have an analysis of the vampire case, but that's okay because it's fake. <laughs> um, so, um, so we need to be able to tell a story, I think, about that form of agency that stretches it over time and decisions not gonna allow us to do that. So I think like, so that's, this, that's part one of the, of the first third of the book, which is don't model these as decisions. Part two is in the theory of rationality. So um, the, the currently dominant um, theory of reasons, uh, of practical reasons, right? Reasons why we do things, it's called internalism. Right? The idea is you have a reason to do something if, roughly speaking, um, you would come to agree that you had that reason were you, to, were you to deliberate in a procedurally rational way about how to satisfy the desires you currently have. 
right? So for example, um, you know, maybe I have a reason to drink what's in that cup over there, right? Because I'm thirsty, right? Um, and the idea is, uh, I may not know that I have such a reason at the moment because I haven't thought it through, but it's not much thinking through required in this particular case, right? But were I to think it through in a rational way, I'd realize that I do. And that means even before I think it through, I have the reason. So internalism allows you to ascribe to people reasons that they don't necessarily uh, self-ascribe, right? Um, uh, but what it doesn't allow you to do is ascribe to people reasons that um, are not in some way, don't hook back into their desiderative set, right? The set of motivations that they currently have. Motivation should be understood broadly, right? Desires, projects, loves, affections, right? There's what they care about now, and internalism says what they have reason to do is a function of that. Um, and so what I argue in the second part of the first part of my book is that if you think that you're never gonna be able to understand aspiration. Um, because the aspirant's reasons aren't a function of what she currently cares about. They're a function of what she will come to care about. So they're kind of, um, you could get them by deliberately, deliberating procedurally rationally from the, set, from the person who she will be, but not from the person who she currently is. Um, and you know, one way to bring that out is just to think about like, she may currently be someone who cares like a whole lot more about how much sleep she gets and whether she has free time than looking at her baby's cute face, right? But that doesn't mean that there's no rational path, I think, from where she is now to motherhood. Um, it's maybe worth saying something about that particular case. I talk about it quite a lot, both in the beginning and the end of the book. And I think, you know, it's, it's maybe important to um, every kind of thing that you can aspire to, that it's in kind of ethical category, right? And I do see motherhood as an ethical category rather than say like merely a biological one. And so, I think it takes a long time to become a mother. Like it doesn't just take like as long of amount of time as to see the pregnancy test. Um, and I also think like, um, you know, as your child changes, motherhood changes. And so um, there's opportunities for learning there, let's say, that are important to that example being a possible example for what I'm talking about. Okay, so that's part one of the book, Rationality. Part two is about moral psychology. Right? So it's like, what assumptions are we making in moral psychology that prevent us from acknowledging the phenomenon of aspiration? And um, what I say there is that um, um, essentially the, there's, a, there's already somebody who was, went ahead of me in this particular area, which is Harry Frankfurt. I think there was an assumption and he overturned it, but he didn't quite see the significance of what he was doing um, as I as I understand it. So I've kind of adopted a revisionist, it's like a revisionist version of Frankfurt. So Frankfurt has this great example uh, um, of, uh, imagine a guy who is trying to decide between going to a classical music concert and going um, to the movie that's playing at the same time, and he can't go to both. And he's deliberating, and say he decides to go to the concert. Um, but you could imagine that if it turns out the concert tickets are sold out, he goes to the movie. It's his second choice. Um, now imagine somebody um, who, uh, like somebody is walking towards them and it turns out it's like an old acquaintance. And they are, they're about to like say something nice to the person, like, oh, it's so great to see you. But then they're tempted to just like make a really mean cutting remark, right? And now imagine that they just sort of um, can't get out the words to say the nice thing it wouldn't make sense to be like, well, I'll do my second choice of the mean cutting remark, right? Okay, so what Frankfurt is pointing out is that not all um, like problems of agency are of the first type. That is not all problems of agency where an agent has like multiple options or paths before them can be understood as being able to be put in a hierarchy. So that's the kind of dogma that I'm objecting to. But as I say, Frankfurt already objected to it. So I didn't come up with that problem. Um, um, and, um, but I think he didn't appreciate how deep the problem was. And here's, um, um, here's, here's what he thought. Okay. He thought the problem was that in the second kind of case, the compliment insult case, um, the person can't deliberate about which of the two things to do. Right. So they can't resolve their problem by deliberation. That's correct. I agree with him about, about that. 
Um, but they could resolve it by identification. So they could decide like which kind of person they want to be. So they throw their will in with one side or the other. Um, I think that the problem is deep enough that they can't really see the two options as options, right? Um, so they can't resolve it by identification either because they can't decide which of these two ways do I want to be. And the reason is because um, appreciating the value of being in one of those ways um, gets in the way of appreciating the value of being in the other way. So like insofar as you're in the mindset where one of those ways is a real option for you, the other way isn't even an option. It, it doesn't look like something you might do, right? So what I say is that um, there's a, that, that's what I call an intrinsic conflict. When the, um, the so-called options only show up to you from evaluative perspectives that are themselves conflicting. And there is no stepping back far enough that both of them just look like options to you. You have to always be in one evaluative perspective or the other. Um, and so um, what it's a consequence for me that those kinds of conflicts where, um, you know, you say to yourself, like, of course, I'm going to say the nice thing, but then you're sort of still tempted. For me, that's just like, well, the other evaluative perspective is like coming up. There's not a you that decides between them, right? Um, and so then like, how does one resolve the conflict, right? Now, one can't resolve it by deliberating. Frankfurt and I agree, right? Um, we agree on that point for different reasons. Frankfurt thinks because it can't be decided by deliberation. I think because it's not even available to, deliber to deliberate about, right? Um, so Frankfurt's solution, which is that you just decide or identify, doesn't work for me. I think you resolve those conflicts by aspiring. That is, I think what you do is you try to become the person who more fully inhabits the one evaluative perspective. And it's a problem of kind of attention, right? So we can inhabit, in some sense, multiple evaluative perspectives at once in the way in which we can sort of like have our attention be split, right? But when you're like paying attention to one thing, but then you're being distracted, there isn't some, any point for you to step back where you get like all the data in view, right? So the, the distraction is kind of a genuine one. And so I don't think you can resolve it by any stepping back move, um, but I think you can resolve it by changing into the kind of person who only hears the one voice or something. Okay, so that's, um, that's where the theory of aspiration sort of speaks to the moral psychologist. There's some stuff about weakness of will too, but maybe I'll skip over that. Um, um, uh, and then the final part of the book is about moral responsibility. Um, and it is about the problem of self-creation. Right? So in order for aspiration to be possible, it needs to be possible to create yourself. But most philosophers have thought you can't do that. Right? So um, I need to argue that it is possible. Um, that's the sort of dogma in that part of the book. Um, and uh, you know, what, I, um, um, what I argue is that people have understood anything that could count as self-creation sort of in like one of two ways. One way would be, well, you make a decision about who to become on the basis of like more perfectly fulfilling the set of values or desires you currently have, right? So you could like decide you, decide you want to go to the gym every day because you value health, but you're not instantiating that value. Um, but that's not self-creation, right? Because you already have the self, right? You're just not being consistent with it. So that's one option. Um, um, there, it just looks like there isn't really any creation, right? And then the other option is, well, you could get a whole new self because you were like hit on the head by a brick with a brick or something, or like, you know, you had some experience that just changed you, right? So there's a new self, but you didn't create it. It's not really self-creation, right? And I think people have really thought that's a very powerful dilemma. It is a powerful dilemma, right? It looks like, look, Either the new self that you get is a product of your reasoning and therefore entailed by the previous state you were in, in which case it's not really creation, right? Um, or the new self is not a product and is rationally unconnected to the self that you had, in which case you didn't do the creating, it's just a new self popped up, right? So there's like a dilemma that people have posed in one way or another for the very idea of self-creation. And what I try to do is to show that 
um, the person who poses that dilemma is right um, in um, saying that there are two requirements on anything that could count as self-creation. So one is that the, the, the created self has to be genuinely new and not derivable by any kind of rational entailment from the earlier self. So I'm willing to allow that, right? And the other is there has to be a relation of normative dependence between the two selves, which is to say one of the selves has to be derivable from the other. The reason why it seemed to people like this is a nut you can't crack is because they've always assumed that it has to be the later self that's derived from the earlier one. And so what I argue is if you just flip that, <laughs> then you solve the problem. So I think there are relations of rational entailment between the two selves, but they go the other way. So the self that is like the governing or authoritative self from which the norms spring is the later self, and the governed self is the earlier self. So one way to think about it is that it's like the opposite of promising, right? So if I promise to do something for you, then my later self is bound by what my earlier self did, right? So my, um, you know, there's a relation of normative dependence that is past heavy, right? Um, the throw weight is the past. And a lot of people have just even reflexively assumed that anything like self-creation would have to be modeled along the lines of promising. So Joseph Ross does that. He uses the promising example specifically as like, what it would mean to create oneself. is like to make promises that oneself later has to keep, okay? And so my thought is, I actually could use the language of promising to express it, but in a kind of perverse way, I could say sometimes we talk about some prospect that's like a promising one, like that's a promising idea, right? <laughs> we don't mean that it's making a promise. We mean sort of like that we can see something about it that we're later gonna be more clear about. Um, so um, it's in that other sense of promising that I think um, that comes closer to what I am talking about. And so essentially what I think is that we, we sort of look up to our future selves. We try to become them. We don't view ourselves as governing or shaping them, right? Um, and so if we model <clears throat> the, the relation between these two selves in that other way, we get around this dilemma. Um, and um, I then have a kind of some implications for the broader implications for the theory of moral responsibility that come out of that. So for example, um, you know, there are questions, there are I think really important questions about a moral responsibility for character. Like what does it take to be responsible for your for the person you are, right? Um, where that isn't I think immediately reducible to or the same as what does it take to be responsible for the things you do. Um, some philosophers have thought that there's like an obvious reduction like, um, responsibility for action can be reducible to responsibility for character because if your character disposes you to act in a certain way, then you're only as responsible for what you do as how responsible you are for having developed the character that would make you do that, right? I don't think that. So I don't think um, as much rides on the question of can we be responsible for our characters as some other people do. But in any case, I think we can be responsible for our characters regardless of whether that's going to be used to explain responsibility for action. And I'm interested in saying something about that because I think the theory of aspiration is the theory of how we are responsible for our characters. And um, uh, so and so, what I say, well, it's pretty straightforward. You're responsible for your character if you got there by aspiring, <laughs> right? So that's, that's the theory. But then there are some interesting wrinkles. So here's one of them. I argue that you can only aspire, well, let me put it this way, that um, if we're looking at someone and we're trying to decide, is she aspiring or not? Um, we can only count her as aspiring if the thing to which we think she's aspiring, we also think it's good, okay? So in a simpler way, you can only aspire to conditions that are good, right? So suppose I aspire to be a mafioso. Well, I can't. <laughs> on my view, you can't do that. It's impossible to aspire to be a mafioso because it's not good to be a mafioso. So on my view, aspiration is a form of learning. It's a form of value learning. And the word learning, like the word knowledge, um, is factive. Right, so you can only, just like you can only know what's the case, you, and also like the word remember, you can only remember what's actually the case, you can only learn what's actually the case. So you can only learn values that are actually there, right? So that creates a bit of a problem for my theory of moral responsibility because it works fine for the good cases, right? So if you're, you know, if you became a lover of classical music and then we wanna know, are you responsible for having become that? The question is, did you get there by aspiring, right? And 
On my view, it's always going to be the case that the answer is only partly because aspiration rests on a like community in the background of people helping you, right? So if you took a music appreciation class, you didn't do all of it, your teacher helped you out, right? Okay, so I, I think we don't tend to be completely responsible for our characters, even in the good case. So it's a matter of degree. But, but I think you can contrast, right? So you can take, like, take two kids and they both, um, you know, came to be able to appreciate a certain piece of music by playing it, right? And they both play it equally well and they both appreciate it in exactly the same way. But one of them has, like, comes from a wealthy family, has a piano teacher, mother, has lots of leisure for, like, playing the piano. The other one... Um, you know, comes from a poor family and has to like make time for the piano and is self-taught, right? We would want to say that one bears more responsibility for having developed in himself the character such as to appreciate the piece than the first one. The first one, I'm sure, also has some of it, right? So anyway, I can make comparative judgments about the good case, right? Um, but there's still the bad case, which is a problem for me, okay? And so um, I don't think, I can't say, well, if you're a bad person or if you have a bad character or if you value things that are not in fact valuable, then you're responsible for that to the extent that you got there by aspiring because I think you can aspire to those things. I think you can value things that aren't valuable. So I think you can make value mistakes. I don't think the word value, in the sense it's a thing we do, is um, uh, effective in the way that the word no is. So. I think people can value things that aren't valuable, but I don't think that they can come to value those things by learning. So how do they come to value them? Um, well, once again, I think we're going to want two different cases, right? We're going to want the case in which they're responsible and the case in which they're not. So we need at least two ways. Right? So um, one of the cases I consider in my book is one that um, I, um, I personally found very compelling and it was happening at the time when I was writing the book. Um, there was this sort of senator's chief of staff, Ryan Loscarn, who, uh, you know, he's kind of an up and coming DC player who was arrested for uh, having child pornography on his computer and like really violent and really horrible child pornography. And he sort of experienced this immediate like cutting off from his community. People just like, you know, he was immediately fired and everyone would want to distance himself from him because it's the kind of like crime that we don't even want to think about, right? And um, he, it went, um, when he was in jail, he um, talked to a counselor and eventually he wrote this letter, okay, um, which was then put online by his family. He committed suicide afterwards, so, but I don't think it was a suicide note. It was just like a letter that he wrote to explain himself. Um, uh, but it kind of, it's hard not to hear it as a suicide note, given that he shortly after that committed suicide. Anyway, what the letter says is that he uh, was sexually abused as a child, like at the ages of five and seven, and that he never told anyone except finally this counselor in jail. And um, that he, you know, he felt like he had really mastered and overcome his abuse, and he felt like a more controlled person because of how he'd responded to it. He kind of prided himself on the secrecy that in which he sort of preserved this like bad secret, but that he now he can sort of see that that event made him into the person that he is. And he is very explicitly in the letter saying like that he feels morally responsible for what he did in terms of perpetuating the abuse of these children by consuming this pornography. Um, but that, you know, the, so he, he's not trying to be absolved of moral responsibility for what he did, but he does want to say, like, look, part of what made me enjoy this pornography was that it felt like a, uh, it spoke to me. It spoke to the experience that I'd had. Um, I identified with these children. Um, and, uh, and, you know, becoming that person, the person to whom that spoke, that was not his responsibility. Okay, so I find this case very compelling. And... I want a theory of aspiration that explains why someone in this position isn't morally responsible, at least for developing that character. And what I want to say is that he's not morally responsible um, because what it would be to be responsible would be to um, be culpable for not aspiring out of the bad condition that you're in. Um, or, you know, be culpable for not aspiring towards some good condition. Right. So culpability for bad character is a matter of culpability for failure to aspire. 
And the reason why he's not culpable for his failure to aspire is that the shame and secrecy in which he sort of locked himself meant that nobody could help him. And we can't aspire by ourselves. None of us can, ever. Um, and so, um, you know, you would be culpable for not aspiring if, in effect, um, in spite of having people to help you, you still didn't do it, <laughs> right? And so um, it's people, it's, that's the condition of, um, in which someone will be more respons morally responsible for their bad character if they, um, if they were not locked away in the way that he was through shame and secrecy. But um, despite having available to you um, resources and people who would help you aspire to a better condition, you nonetheless didn't do that. Okay, so that's more responsibility and moral failure. Um, and yeah, that's it. That's the book. <laughs> ¶¶